Thank you very much, Sophie. Nice to be back in uh, Cardiff again, and very nice to be uh, able to talk to you about uh, one of my uh, research interests. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of movie about -y sort of person, um, and I might even get the inclination to, to ask uh, a question. I mean, I don't, has anybody been on Hudge um, um, who's here? So uh, it, it may be that uh, a timely contribution at some point uh, would be appreciated. Um, holy spaces contest, sorry, holy places contested spaces, uh, British Muslim experiences of Hajj. Um, what, what on earth is that opening part of um, the title all about? Um, well, I think we can certainly understand how and why uh, Mecca uh, in Saudi Arabia, where Muslims go for Hajj, um, is a holy place, um, a space that, like other pilgrimage sites, has often been seen as uh, set apart uh, from the profane world. So when Muslims uh, go for Hajj and they go through the uh, Mikat, the station that marks uh, where uh, Muslims and non-Muslims um, are segregated because, of course, uh, non-Muslims are not allowed into the space of Hajj, um, we can see clearly then there's a, a sense of entering sacred space. But what do we mean by contested spaces? Well, I'm, I'm just picking up in this um, presentation, in this research, on some ideas that have come through in pilgrimage studies. So it may be um, that some of the things that we can learn from studying Hajj also have relevance uh, for other forms of pilgrimage. And certainly an idea that's come through from Christian studies of pilgrimage is that although pilgrimage sites are indeed set apart in that people experience a very strong sense of community and also a very strong sense of unity many times uh, across uh, racial categories, across ethnic categories, uh, across categories of social class, um, the argument here and the argument in the literature I'm referring to is really that both of these things are held in tension in pilgrimage sites. So we can't say that the space of Mecca, the space of Hajj, is entirely a space set apart from the normal social, economic, political sorts of divisions that we sometimes find in wider society. So I'm very much interested here to hear British Muslims talk about this strong sense of the Ummah coming together as a united Muslim community. But I'm also interested in the ways in which in coming together millions of people in one place, one time, how they also reflect on difference, how they look back to their British Muslimness perhaps, um, and how that comes through when they travel overseas. So um, Muslims of course have travelled for um, many, many centuries for Hajj, um, but it's this coming together of Muslims from all over the world that perhaps uh, makes it um, so special. So, holy places, contested spaces, um, those are some of the issues um, I'm trying to grapple with and I hope I've put that uh, in straightforward uh, enough uh, terms. Um, I'm going to try and talk about three things in my talk uh, and then at the end I'm going to try and sum up by reflecting on some of the work um, that I've been doing for the British Museum um, in contributing to their exhibition. Um, we've been doing two things. One is running a survey, um, and if you've been for Hajj and you haven't completed the survey, I'll be inviting you to do that. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is um, collecting interviews. And, um, I'm in the sort of in-between stage at the moment of having gathered the material, posted it all off to the British Museum, seen them cut 
uh, 40 hours of, of, of stuff down to about 15 minutes um, and then I'll have the chance um, later on to really work through that but as I go through the presentation um, which looks back at my previous work but I'll also try and pick up one or two observations about um, how things have moved on in the last decade. So three things. An obvious point. In the global world we know today where time and space is being compressed, where one can travel quite quickly and easily across the world, um, pilgrimage is changing. So a simple observation that the Hajj has been transformed in modern times, um, most obviously in terms of the very large numbers of people that can now travel for Hajj. So one of the points that I'll be making vis-a-vis -vis British Muslims, uh, and a lot of my work has been on South Asian heritage Muslims, um, is that if we look back um, in previous generations uh, to their families, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, um, they didn't have the same sorts of expectations of going for Hajj um, as British Muslims do today. And I suppose that raises interesting questions about um, religiosity in the modern world. The second point, I suppose, that I want to make is really thinking about the relationship between uh, a tradition which uh, suggests that one performs rituals in certain sorts of ways um, and there are all sorts of books available now that inform you how you might perform your Hajj rituals. Um, the difference between that or the experience of individuals, of human beings as social agents, as people who actively perform their faith, so the, the tension and also the relationship between receiving a tradition, understanding what one has to perform as a haji, but the little improvisations, the little inflections of personal meaning um, that come through uh, in performance. Um, and there might just be one or two um, little recollections from the material that will help bring that forward, uh, that point forward. So, I suppose that reiterates the point I was making about the sacred and the profane. That really we can't think of a pilgrimage space as a space that's simply and entirely set apart as a lot of theorists in the past did. We have to really understand um, sacredness and profaneness um, perhaps being negotiated step by step along the pilgrimage way. And then finally, I suppose, I wanted to reflect on the memory of doing Hajj and its impact on one's religious life. Um, certainly one of the things that's really struck me uh, interviewing most recently in this round of work for the British Museum is how much emotion and sense of self for many Muslims is bound up with this journey. So when we think of people's own journeys of self-identity um, and the way that that maps onto the idea of travelling to a place to be reborn, to be purified, um, this can be incredibly touching and moving and I was uh, amazed actually I must say um, that um, Hajj journeys that may have taken place uh, several uh, years ago, maybe more than that, uh, still regularly reduced uh, people to tears. So, so it's a really, really profound journey uh, for Muslims and connects them, I think my final point would be, uh, in all sorts of different ways to their Muslim identity. If we think about British Muslims as uh, a community or a set of communities that often have connections rooted very strongly now here in Britain, but also perhaps looking back to various homelands, we can also see too how sometimes when identity is a fraught issue, um, that identification with a spiritual homeland uh, can be something that's terribly important for people. 
So, um, in a sense, I've, I've tried to really sort of get some of those big issues out there uh, for you, and I'll, I'll try and sort of fill in um, the pieces a little bit. That's just a reference if you were interested uh, in uh, following up some uh, earlier writing um, that I've done on this work. Um, and my initial work was very much focused in the north of England and on British uh, Pakistani uh, communities. Uh, the more recent work um, is, as I say, a combination of around 30 interviews with pilgrims. Um, and we can perhaps cover this in the, in the questions if people want to, to go there. We've also been talking in quite small numbers, and I think this is um, part of the research that could be expanded with tour operators, with guides, with welfare op organisations, uh, and also um, the trading standards industry. Um, so it's just a reminder that um, pilgrimage, um, hajj going, uh, is also um, big business in the UK um, as it is um, elsewhere. So on the one hand we can look very clearly at um, spiritual journeys and religious identity and Hajj, uh, but we can also look at the whole business around Hajj um, and some of those um, tensions around that. Um, again, probably uh, if you really uh, would like to follow up on the British Museum work, uh, you can quite easily um, go to its website, uh, for instance, um, there's this rather nice uh, part of the site here, uh, which is called um, Hajj Stories. And you can add uh, in uh, your own most vivid memory of Hajj. And I suppose, um, thinking about students, for instance, people who might be writing uh, dissertations, you know, there might be some quite uh, interesting material there for you uh, to look at. And um, there's some video um, that was collected at the Living Islam Camp um, which is held in the uh, East Midlands most um, summers. Um, I actually remember, I was there and I remember this man here giving um, his account uh, and he was talking about how one year he was let down by his uh, tour operator um, and he was talking about how he did go successfully the next year and how sweet it was for him um, because um, he'd had to be patient and patience is a, is a real virtue that so many pilgrims talk about. Sabr. Um, they talk about the need for sabr, for patience, when performing hajj. Um, because it's difficult, of course, uh, to perform all those rituals um, with uh, two million people about you. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, um, you can go along to the, um, the site. You can also uh, go along to London and visit the exhibition. Um, there's a few events actually going on this week. Um, there's some late talks on Friday and also a, a study day on Saturday. But uh, uh, certainly, even if you can't get to London, there's some interesting um, things to look at there. Now, I'm not going to, to labour that because I guess that uh, I could probably uh, talk about uh, that for, 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 for rather too long. Um, let me just show you, as I'm bound to do, um, the survey. So this is a survey w w that we're running. Um, again, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've been for Hajj, please complete it. If uh, you're a student, uh, perhaps you're using these sorts of surveys yourself. This one is with uh, um, the um, uh, Bristol um, University surveys. Uh, you have to be quite dedicated. You need suburb to complete the, sur uh, the survey. Um, I mean, all sorts of people were advising me to go for a really kind of light, short survey, but that, that's really not in my um, nature. So um, I want to publicly thank the 188 people who've uh, completed it to date, um, because I think there are about uh, 60 questions. Um, so, and I'm going to finish up my talk um, um, this evening by talking a little bit about um, the uh, some of the headlines are from the survey. So really this is just uh, a bid to engage you of course and uh, um, get you interested um, if, if words are failing in that regard. 
Um, I suppose it's just really a way of, of flagging, you know, how much um, the carbon here we can see, um, how much it's it's really changed um, in um, the last uh, century or so. Um, air travel has really brought very large numbers, um, but also I'm, I'm quite interested too in uh, how consumer culture, how um, popular culture too. Um, issues around rising rates of literacy, of course, um, which I guess is marked across the Muslim world, but also significant, especially in um, the West and the diaspora. So in terms of issues around religious authority, um, you know, how do you find out about Hajj? Uh, well, perhaps you go to your local sheikh, or uh, you travel with your sheikh, or uh, you rely on a, a mutawif, a guide to take you around. Um, but uh, in, in modern times, we know that uh, religious identity is very often framed in terms of more of an, a sense of the interior uh, elements of religion. Um, so the Hajj book, in the same way that we have uh, travel books for all sorts of other uh, excursions, the Hajj coach, uh, disembodied but available online. Uh, high value packages as well as um, the basic package. And one very significant difference that has taken place in the decade or so since um, I did my research was that back uh, in the early 2000s um, there was less regulation of um, there was less regulation of um, the packages, the ways in which uh, one needed to sign up for going on Hajj. So in the past one could just really uh, show up in Saudi Arabia, um, get a very basic hotel, sort of bunk down probably with about 10 other people in a room um, and away you go. But um, because there have been all sorts of um, issues with um, the experiences of Hajjis, uh, many of which uh, actually prompted the formation of British Muslim Hajj welfare organisations, and there are two main ones. Again, we could talk about those in the questions. Um, the Saudis have sought to regulate um, the Hajj um, business um, much more um, thoroughly. Mm. Um, so to go now, you have to buy into a particular sort of package, although you can still expect to pay um, high 2000s up to about £5,000 uh, for a, a high uh, class uh, package. So, so choice uh, is, is really part of um, the deal um, right now. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that I could say but I suppose I just wanted to highlight um, one or two points in relation to um, the changing face of pilgrimage. Again with reference back to um, the experience of that relationship with Mecca as a holy place uh, in the religious imagination. Uh, if we think about those um, towns and villages in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, uh, two, three, four generations ago, um, there was really no expectation of going for Hajj. Um, yes, it was possible, yes, some people did go, but um, certainly for uh, women and um, other groups, um, it really wasn't something that uh, was very likely. So you have a different sort of relationship um, with Makkah, one that is very much bound up with the imagination. It's important still, uh, it's un unseen yet present when you bow down to pray you're facing Mecca, uh, it's on the horizon. Um, so this sense of, of longing, of remoteness, um, does build up a particular sort of um, religiosity. Um, and perhaps we can contrast that in some ways to um, Hajj going after migration. And of course there's a number of factors at work here, but one is of course general globalisation, general increase in uh, international um, air travel, but so too is the fact that Hajjis 
from the UK are a better uh, place in, in terms of wealth. They can afford to go. So if we think back to the 70s and 80s, uh, people uh, who'd come to Britain to work, they might pay for their parents, their grandparents to go from their villages back home, and then eventually they might think about um, themselves. But in those days, it was still very much the, 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 the idea that one would go towards the end of one's life. So Hajj going uh, something for the mature person. When you put on the ihram, um, it's anticipating um, preparing to uh, face your maker. Um, it's making yourself clean as you prepare uh, for your final journey in many ways. So what we see in the UK with the immediacy, the affordability, although that's now becoming an issue, um, the prices really are getting um, very expensive with all these new hotels being built up. Uh, democratised in the sense that um, if, if you uh, are infirm or perhaps have a disability, um, there's more possibility to go. Um, so we can perhaps tie that into new sorts of religiosities too. Younger people are going for Hajj. I uh, was talking to a tour operator in Blackburn uh, just a few months ago uh, and I was quite taken aback when he said that about 75% of his clients, a tour group that he'd taken of around 375 people, about 75% of those have been young married couples. So there's very much this sense of um, probably perhaps being uh, young uh, professional people, uh, having the uh, economic a possibility to go and of course Hajj becomes a fard, it becomes um, a duty on you when you can afford it. Um, but religiously serious young people getting married, um, starting a new stage of their life, Hajj is the right time uh, to do it. So there's still a lot of pragmatism around going for Hajj amongst British Muslims per se, but certainly for some young people it's a key stage in a spiritual journey. Okay, I'm just sort of flashing up some, some different sorts of images there. Um, the Kaaba again, people performing the tawaf, the circling of the Kaaba, um, really sort of captures that sense um, that religious studies scholars have of a sense of community a sense of what some have called an oceanic feeling of, of being a drop in the ocean, that sense of togetherness, of oneness. Um, and yet, um, if we actually scaled back from the Kaaba, we'd see um, this, this great big hotel now overlooking it. Um, and you can actually say your prayers uh, within the uh, hotel because it's considered part of the um, the haram, it's considered part of um, the mosque. And of course this is an attempt to deal with um, very large numbers, but it's also, uh, for some, it raises questions about uh, authenticity, it raises questions about um, a sense of that connection uh, to the past. When, when pilgrims return to Mecca, many of them feel like they're returning to a spiritual home. Um, but sometimes the home that they think they're coming to um, is the home that they have watched on their Sunday afternoon film, The Message. Um, so sometimes that, that sense of um, expectation, I mean, it's, it's part of our life in so many ways, but the imagination and the reality does create um, some tensions. Okay, so uh, again, just a, a couple of uh, short points here, really. Uh, maybe one or two more, than, uh, but uh, I'll skip through them fairly quickly. Um, so yes, absolutely, pilgrims very much report this strong sense of separation from dunya, from the profane world, an intensified sense of, of God's consciousness, remembering the trials of prophets of the past. So you're coming to Mecca, you're connecting with Muslims, uh, your contemporaries, but you're also looking back to 
a received tradition. You feel part of history. This is, is so prominent in pilgrim narratives. Being there, you pray at home, you face the horizon. You can't see Mecca, but you, you image it, and suddenly it's in front of you. Um, that really is one of the most emotional um, moments. And uh, as, as some of my uh, data from the survey, I've always wanted to say that, um, being a, a, a real ethnographer and field worker myself, um, that really reinforces um, that as a special moment um, for our uh, respondents. So we have these oceanic feelings, we have this sense of togetherness, a sense of performing um, rituals in light of tradition, but then we have these wonderful personal improvisations as well. Going around the Kaaba, uh, some people attempt to kiss um, the black stone lodged in a corner. Um, and some people struggle quite hard to do that. Other people um, think it's a far more uh, spiritual thing, perhaps, to, to, to stay back and to keep the good manners, the good adab of the holy places. One young man had gone with his mother, and every time he went around, he, he just kissed her hand. Just a little improvisation um, that made that sort of connection between uh, his own um, sense of uh, identity and what was emotionally important to him, and this, this great uh, moment that he was a part of. Now, I think I've already covered that in my little reference to uh, the, <coughs> the film industry. Um, just a few more points. I talked about patience and suffering already, but also um, failure, getting things wrong, uh, not being able to perform the rituals. Um, that, that's something that comes through in accounts too and, and people think about that in quite different sorts of ways but again it shows us how a religious tradition uh, relies very much on people to perform it to make Islam to make the Hajj uh, through their performance every year um, and these performances are, are never perfect and that's part of um, how uh, humans um, as social actors um, can uh, infuse their actions with some sort of agency. Um, cosmopolitanism, the idea of uh, all sorts of differences happily coexisting together, that's there in the Hajj. People talk about uh, being unable to share um, a language um, but making a connection. Um, a shared understanding. And yet we also have real differences, um, cheek by jowl. Um, for British pilgrims, it's interesting that they often reflect on their Hajj being a privileged Hajj. And it's still possible to see um, pilgrims from poorer parts of the world um, struggling in a way that British pilgrims don't feel that they have to struggle. So we can see, for instance, coming back to one of my initial points, how issues around social class and wealth um, are inflected through the Hajj space, even though, even though it's, it's still a cosmopolitan space, it's still a space of, of shared uh, Muslim identity. And of course there are theological debates too. I'm not going to go into that, um, but Certainly there are Puritan religious ideologies and more devotional ones um, that perhaps beyond the immediate Hajj rituals, let's say in Medina where the Prophet's Mosque is and various sites of pilgrimage, um, there may be an attempt to discipline certain sorts of religiosity um, to make it uh, clear that this is incorrect practice. So different Muslims comes together in one space um, and for some there's this sense of connection to oneness but also uh, for others there might be a reinforcement of, of, of difference in some occasions. 
So again, I'm working through um, the journey of Hajj very, very quickly here, um, sketching in broad brush. Um, we started by thinking about um, getting ready for Hajj or, or the going for Hajj, being in the Hajj space, but what about um, coming home? What about being a Hajji? If you go to the exhibition in the British Museum, you'll see uh, a whole um, section there on, on being um, a Hajji. And certainly a lot of the um, accounts that they liked uh, from, from the material we collected um, drew on some of those sorts of reflections. Uh, coming home, what do you bring with you um, and what impact does it have on you? So just, a, just a, a little point here, I suppose, thinking about souvenirs, material culture, uh, what people bring back um, and how it helps people remember Remember I was talking about how people can be so easily moved by recalling the Hajj, but gifts of all sorts um, of um, type. Um, so we have the, the dates, of course. We have the Zamzam water. Um, you know, if you've been in a, in a Muslim home or you've been to visit someone who's been for Hajj, you'll be invited for dates. You'll be invited for Zamzam. You might be invited to, to face uh, the Kaaba as you drink. Um, but even more seemingly secular items um, can also be carriers of that sense of um, specialness. Um, so people have talked about watches, even a pair of uh, Dame Edna Everidge glasses that were picked up. Um, and they were special because they carried the sense of a parent, uh, a cousin, whoever, being in the holy places, and it, it was a reminder to them. Now, other items, perhaps prayer mats, um, very obvious means of connecting one back to the holy places. If you've bought a prayer mat in Saudi Arabia, if you bought it in Mecca, uh, you lay it out um, and you pray on it, it, again, it can transport you in a way that perhaps um, you might not if you didn't have that trigger. And just to, to sort of wrap up these um, thoughts, um, what is the impact of, of Hajj for Hajjis? And again, we get a range of, of responses. Um, certainly for some, a sense of, of permanent renewal, a, 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 a changing point in one's life. But um, for others, perhaps something more of a fading sense of impact or efficacy. Um, it's quite hard uh, to be good. It's quite hard to be, um, to maintain that sense of religiosity. And certainly um, an interesting account that I recall was a young woman uh, returning who talked about being very, very happy to wear her hijab when she was in the holy space of Mecca. It felt right there. But she also felt deeply connected here to Britain and the life that she had here. She was glad she went for Hajj, but she, she found it difficult to maintain um, that wearing of her hijab. And after a number of uh, weeks, um, she decided to take it off. So we can see that there are very different sorts of um, trajectories in terms of British Muslim identity. And all of those will be played out through Hajj experiences. You might, well, if you talk to some of the older generation, um, have a sense that, yes, um, the sacred is over-available. People go for Hajj now and they're, they're on their phones and they're taking photos and they're checking their football results so that, you know, the, the sort of globalised world is constantly reaching in. But it's very clear, and I think this comes through uh, in some of the survey material I just want to look at briefly, that, that, that going on Hajj, going on Umrah, which is the minor pilgrimage you can take any time of year, it's certainly uh, an important part of the religious lives 
of, of many British Muslims. The, the possibility of going there, of travelling to a holy place, um, does exercise what, what I'm calling a sort of homing desire. Um, so people have that desire to, to get back to a, a, a spiritual home, perhaps maybe just for a top-up of, of spirituality, to touch base with a space that's differently made up than secular Britain today. Now I'm interested in all sorts of things but I think I'll just sort of finish off the last five minutes and really just whip you through um, some of the things that are coming up. Um, now I have to say that uh, we, we really push this survey um, through sort of social media and so on. So it, it, it's, it's a particular sort of sample, it's a window on a particular sort of British Muslim world. Um, when I just sort of did this little sort of jotting of, of, of some of the headlines, we had 177, 188 today when I checked this afternoon in Cardiff. If only 12 people in Cardiff went away and completed the survey, we'd, we'd, we'd hit that uh, 200 barrier. And I have to say, Cardiff, <laughs> uh, we need a few more um, entries from, from, from Cardiff. So, so this is my moment to, to try and break the 200 barrier. So thank you for that, Sophie. Um, now, this I thought was quite interesting, that 35% of the grandparents of these people had been for Hajj which actually was pretty high, but 80% um, of their parents had, um, and 85, um, I'm, I'm sorry, 91% of the respondents have always had that expectation of going for Hatch. So I think, um, you know, it's easy to read too much into um, statistics, and somebody's going to nail me on all this in a moment. Um, uh, I'll just plead ignorance. Um, but... To, to me, I think there's, there's an interesting um, little window here on, on social change. It would have been really good to have been able to, to get some sense of what great-grandparents had been able to do. But, but we can see quite a significant leap. Um, the parents, I think, probably here are um, the migrant um, generation. Um, the grandparents, perhaps, um, those um, that were initially... Um, back in um, the homeland. Um, so their, their Hajj going is, is relatively high, I would imagine, compared to um, general statistics. Um, but we can see this massive leap, um, really, um, amongst the migrants themselves and their children really having this expectation that, yeah, I'm going to go for Hajj, you know. Um, what's, what's the issue? Now, now... <coughs> As I say, partly this is to do with wealth, partly it's to do with air travel and capacity in Saudi Arabia. But if you talk to Muslims from other countries in the UK, let's say overseas students, and um, the quotas back home um, prevent a lot of Muslims from going for Hajj. Um, so for British Muslims, and about 25,000 go every year, um, there really isn't that sort of restriction in terms of quota. So... Um, it's a different sort of Hajj economy um, for um, British Muslims. Um, an interesting one, and perhaps not surprising given who we surveyed, but 78.5 now say that the best time to go for Hajj is when you're young. And it was interesting, um, some of the um, narrative data that came out, some of the responses we asked people to type in. Um, on the one hand, they were saying, well, you know, if, you sh if you can afford to go, you should go. Um, they also said uh, it's physically very hard, so you actually need to be quite young and strong to complete Hajj. But they were also saying it's, it's really a perfect way of, of getting off on the right foot in your adult life. And the earlier you can go, the better to lay down a foundation for a solid uh, future. Now, all right. That was lurking at the bottom. Um, again, just sort of underlining, yes, that Hajj is a duty, um, but when asked to identify the most 
important reason in determining why people went for Hajj. About a third, a little bit less than that, but I think a significant number were talking very much about this, this personal need, personal identity. So this relationship between duty, religious duty, tradition, but also the needs of personal identity is something um, that's quite interesting to talk about. Um, tour operators there, I'm not going to say much about that, somebody might want to ask me about that. Um, interesting, I guess, um, to sort of pick out that going and seeking forgiveness from others seems very important to a lot of people. Um, a third of people only would make a will, so really putting their affairs in order. Um, coming back to something we talked about in the paper, 42% uh, found it quite difficult to perform the rituals uh, properly. Um, actually, it was about a similar sort of number that found it was, it was quite easy, so a real kind of division there. Um, and then just coming back, I suppose, to the point about young people, 54.2% um, said being pious on return was mostly expected. And, and part of the, the discussion that I've, I've tapped into is that there's a sense in which, well, there's Hajis everywhere now. Um, it used to be something that was exceptional. Um, and, of course, when you were sort of uh, sitting um, there and uh, Haji, uh, Haji Saab, as they would say in South Asia, um, you know, it was a special thing, perhaps. Um, but now there are so many Hajis, and um, perhaps um, there are some question marks about, you know, how significant that, 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 that title um, remains. Um, I, th I thought this was interesting, that 40% found it difficult to really slip back into everyday life. So that sense of, of crossing a boundary and returning to everyday life. Um, I, I have some accounts where people are actually very disoriented. They're sort of intoxicated by the sense of being in a spiritual zone. And, and it really um, spooks them when they come back um, to the UK. Um, and very high uh, levels of desire to go back, but of course um, that's something that one is very easily able to do. I think I probably need to stop there, um, and hopefully that's a reasonable way of uh, drawing things to a close. Um, so thanks for your attention, and I hope that you found something um, of interest in that, and I'm happy to take any questions.